Well, as we come to God's word, let's pray. Lord, speak to us now through your word. Give us listening ears, give us obedient hearts. And we ask this for your glory. Amen. Well, a brief setting of the scene before we read Psalm 101. Uh, it might help to know that Psalms 92 to 101 focus on God's kingship. So Psalms 93, 97, 99 all begin with the words, the Lord reigns. And Psalm 98 verse 6 tells us the Lord is king. And Psalm 101 is probably set at the very beginning of David's reign and his failed attempt to bring the ark of the covenant back to Jerusalem. When he says to God, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 9? And he asks an almost identical question in verse 2 of this psalm. And in that chapter in 2 Samuel, David is reminded of God's holiness and God's desire for holy living in his people. And so here in Psalm 101 is David, as it were, setting out his stall for the kind of king he's going to be and the kind of court he's going to have. The example of holy living he wants to set in verses 1 and 2. The kind of people he wants around him in verse 6 and those he doesn't want around him in verses 3 to 5 and 7 to 8. So with those introductions, let's read Psalm 101 of David, a psalm. I will sing of love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate, they will not cling to me. Men of perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Whoever slanders his neighbour in secret, him will I put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him will I not endure. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evil doer from the city of the Lord. So Psalm 101 has two themes, pursuing holiness, opposing evil. So first, pursuing holiness in verses 1, 2 and 6. David, with his I will declarations, names four characteristics of holiness he's aiming to pursue. In verse 1, there's love, what should really be mercy, and justice. So the opening verse should begin, I will sing of mercy and justice. And both mercy and justice speak to us of the attributes of God. Just in the psalm before, in Psalm 100, verse 5, we read, For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. And in the psalm before that, in Psalm 99, verse 4, The king, that is God, loves justice. So David wants to be like God in these attributes of mercy and justice. God had said to his people repeatedly, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And this is what God will say later through the prophet Micah. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And that's what David's other two pursuits are about in verse 2. A blameless life and a blameless heart. And blamelessness speaks of integrity, of sincerity. And in this verse, we find another oft-repeated theme that we've seen in the Psalms, that in the end, our walk with God is a matter of our heart. Remember God's choice of David as king 
was based on the premise that the Lord looks on the heart. And then in verse 6, we find that what David wants for himself, he also wants for those around him. His court advisers will be those who are faithful and whose walk is blameless. And how much we need to pray that those whom God has put in high positions of authority will love mercy and justice, will seek to, to pattern lives of godly integrity, and they will fill their administrations with those whose hearts have truly been touched by God. And how we need to pray that God will grow in our hearts those fruits of his Holy Spirit, living lives that are distinctive in their holiness and their integrity. And then secondly, opposing evil, verses 3 to 5 and 7 to 8. The 18th century philosopher Edmund Burke is reputed to have said that for evil to triumph, it is necessary only for good men to do nothing. And in the remainder of this psalm, David is, if you like, giving us the biblical version of that truth. Yes, we must pursue holiness, but we must also actively oppose evil. And for David, the evil are described as the faithless, verse 3, those of perverse heart, verse 4, the slanderers, the proud, in verse 5, the liars, in verse 7, and just in case he's missed anyone, the wicked and the every evil doer, in verse 8. And for these folk, David has another list of I wills. I will have nothing to do with them, verse 4. I will put them to silence, verse 5, which he repeats in verse 8. And I will cut them off from the city of the Lord, verse 8. Now clearly we need to exercise both grace and caution in how we oppose evil. But as one commentator writes on these verses, the tone of the Psalms can serve as a much needed shock to Christians to shock us out of our well-regulated slumber. And this well-regulated slumber is often too interested on merely being nice and thereby denying the truth that the gospel will always be awkward and controversial in the world. And so David reminds us of our responsibility to embody the teaching of scripture both as an example of godly lifestyle and as active opponents of evil and injustice. Well, already that gives us quite a number of takeaways from this psalm. But before we close, I have bad news and I have good news. The bad news is the obvious incongruity between the godly ideals that David sets out here and the way David's reign worked out. Yes, David had these wonderful aims and ideals, but scripture tells us that he fell woefully short of them. Yes, he started well, but the later years of his reign were marked by personal sin and growing violence both within his family and in his court. And so scripture shows us that in the end, David, like you and like me, is a sinner. The good news is that there is a king who came and did not fail and does not fail and will not fail to show mercy and justice, and even whose enemies conceded that his life was blameless. Not David, but David's greatest son, of whom the prophet Isaiah would speak in these words, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever. So let us pursue holiness and oppose evil. And, but put our ultimate trust, not in human rulers, 
but in he who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and from whom alone comes our salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge that we are, like David, sinful and fallible, that we fail to live up to those standards of integrity and godliness and holiness which you seek. But Lord, we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ, who came as the true King, whose life was truly blameless and therefore could pay the price of our sin. So, Lord, we thank you for this psalm and for all that it teaches us. Would you nurture our hearts to learn from these truths today and put them into practice? We ask it for your glory. Amen.